Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. Canada's immigration minister to investigate revoking the Canadian citizenship of a known terrorist. Plus, uh, closing arguments continue today in the Freedom Convoy trial. And for the first time in franchise history, the Edmonton Elks have a private owner, and there are talks of the old team's name resurfacing. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Thanks for joining us. Immigration Minister Mark Miller says his plans to look into whether a man accused of plotting a terror attack in Toronto should have his Canadian citizenship revoked. The man and his son face nine terrorism charges and are accused of conspiracy to commit murder on behalf of the Islamic State group. Miller says he's tasked with Deputy Minister, he has tasked his Deputy Minister rather, with establishing a timeline of how the older of the two men became a Canadian citizen. Canada has has the ability to revoke a person's citizenship if they obtain it by providing false information or hiding relevant facts. A hostage release could be key in finalizing a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, according to U.S. officials. Israel has sent its negotiation team to Qatar for ceasefire talks aimed at ending the war in Gaza, with a new round of talks set to begin Thursday. A top Hamas official says they are losing faith in the United States' ability to mediate a ceasefire in the territory. Meanwhile, the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says Israeli strike across Gaza overnight and today have killed at least 17 people, including five children and their parents. Canadian health experts are urging Ottawa to respond to a monkeypox outbreak in Africa. The World Health Organization has deemed a global health emergency. More than 14,000 cases have been confirmed among children and adults in more than a dozen countries, including Congo, where 90, 96% of cases have been reported with little access to vaccines. A health researcher from McGill University says the current risk to Canadians is low, but one the government to provide a further funding and resources to help. The Public Health Agency of Canada says so far there have been no cases of the more serious type of the mpox virus spreading in Africa. The Crown says two prominent Freedom Convoy organizers were strategizing as part of a team to gridlock downtown Ottawa from almost the beginning. Prosecutors argue Tamara Leach and Chris Barber were conspiring together so closely that evidence against one of them should apply to both. Uh, Leach and Barber are co-accused of mischief, intimidation and counseling others to break the law while Barber is also accused of counseling others to disobey a court order. The protest clogged the streets of downtown Ottawa for nearly three weeks in early 2022. The defense was also expected to begin its final submissions today. The mayor of Jasper and other officials were expected to release more details of how the town will allow thousands of wildfire evacuees to return home this Friday. The town's 5,000 residents and about 20,000 more visitors were forced out three weeks ago. A wind-driven wildfire destroyed a third of the town's buildings in Jasper's critical infrastructure escaped some of the damage from the flames but still needs work. Returning residents should review the re-entry guide on the municipality's website to be prepared for the days ahead. Re-entry will be challenging for those who have lost their homes, businesses, and treasured places. Local officials have indicated that there will be a welcome center at Commemoration Park, and that's at 1324 Pyramid Lake Road, with resources and information about mental health, utilities, internet, financial support, and insurance. And while we are all eager to see Jasper heal and thrive again soon, it's important that we show compassion and empathy as our neighbors take stock and grieve their loss. Officials estimate that the fires caused around $283 million in property damage. The local school district is also in a race against the clock to clean up the town's schools ahead of the new school year in September.
In today's world of politics and social media, it's difficult to know what's true. And with terms like misinformation, one is left wondering who's right and who's wrong. Can politicians even tell the truth? This is a question John Robson, columnist for the National Post and Epic Times, addresses in an article called Refusing to Lie or Aqueous is Vital for a Thriving Society. What is the number one thing that people hate about politicians? The thing that comes up again and again in surveys and in conversations, that politicians don't tell the truth. They say what they think will advance them personally, what will advance their party. And they're cunning at it. They put enormous amounts of time and effort into spin control, the result of which, paradoxically, is that nobody believes anything that comes out of their mouths, with rare exceptions. So it's even self-defeating tactically. But at a much more profound level, it means that government goes badly wrong and we can't have a proper discussion about what's wrong because you can't say that is the rule on almost anything that's true and important. Catch more of this interview with John Robson, columnist for the National Post and Epoch Times, and BCN's Michael Clausen coming up later in the program. Highway 2 was forced to close earlier Wednesday morning after a tanker truck overturned into the ditch a few kilometers north of the town of Nanton. RCMP are investigating the cause of the crash and have confirmed that a 31-year-old man has died on the scene. The truck was carrying ammonia nitrate that completely spilled out in the collision. As of Wednesday afternoon, northbound traffic has since reopened while the southbound lanes remain closed. RCMP asks the public to avoid the area while emergency crews continue to clear it. A 24-year-old is dead after being reported missing on Monday when they did not return from hiking in the Kananaskis. Just before 10 a.m. Monday, Kananaskis RCMP received a report of the missing hiker. Police alerted Kananaskis Emergency Services, who advised that a conservation officer was already en route to the area to locate the trailhead where the hiker may have started. RCMP were alerted that the missing person's vehicle was located. Police authorized a helicopter to be deployed, and by noon were advised that the missing hiker had been located deceased on the western slope of Mount Smuts. The deceased was transported out of the area and taken to the, uh, the office of the chief medical examiner. Every day, our homes fill with more and more technology as society innovates and technology advances. But when this happens, we often see our outdated tech devices ending up in landfills after the next upgrades hit the shelves. Well, four years ago, the province embarked on a pilot project to mitigate this problem. And according to Alberta's Minister of Environment and Protected Areas, Rebecca Schultz, uh, it's been a huge success. Since the pilot began, Albertans have recycled nearly 15,000 tons of electronics. That's the weight equivalent of 4,000 cars kept out of landfills, which is why today we're expanding this program. Starting on April 1st, 2025, this e-pilot will become a permanent part of Alberta's province-wide recycling system, creating the biggest and best system in Canada, but of course also meeting the needs of both today and tomorrow. Families and businesses will be able to recycle over 500 extra electronic items, from cell phones to power tools to lawnmowers, and of course, so much more. This expansion will keep 5,500 tons of waste out of landfills every single year. A Calgary judge is reviewing the validity of sanctions placed by Medicine Hat's City Council on Mayor Lindsay Clark and will release a written decision by the end of September after hearing arguments Tuesday from both sides. Justice Rosemary Nation was active in asking questions and pushing for answers as those representing the City of Medicine Hat and Clark uh, spent five hours arguing over whether sanctions placed on Clark should remain in place. She is expected to reach her decision on September the 30th. Well, the Edmonton Elks Football Club has reportedly found a new private ownership for the first time in the franchise's history. The club has historically been community-owned since its inception in 1949, but financial troubles since the COVID-19 pandemic have caused the team to seek private ownership to obtain financial stability. The new owner in question is Larry Thompson, a former construction business owner and season ticket holder. It's expected he will be officially introduced 
introduced at a Thursday morning press conference. According to Dustin Nielsen of Edmonton Sports Talk, there is talk of a desire to rebrand back to the Eskimos brand or simply be referred to as the Esks. The franchise made the name change to Elks in 2021 after pressure came from sponsors and notable figures to drop the name Eskimos during a time when other major sports brands with indigenous namings uh, followed suit. The Elks have struggled mightily on the field since their rebrand as they haven't made it to the playoffs since 2019 and currently hold a record of two and seven. Well, young people from Lethbridge celebrate their International Youth Day. And for this, the YMCA prepared a whole program of recreational activities that made this day the most fun of the year within the facilities. Just as Thompson, a child and youth programs manager with the YMCA, explains what the future generation had on their International Day. We had food trucks in the north parking lot as well as free access to our rec room and indoor play. We also had $5 youth drop-in passes as well. Um, we had some activities in the field house going on, so we had ping pong and uh, obstacle courses. We had a Mario Kart tournament as well. We had some community partners come in, so we had the library and the nature center come and um, help us celebrate the youth by providing some other activities. Um, and we also had a DJ in the aquatic center. 300 people attend the event. Um, we had 113 people buy the day passes. Sounded like a pretty good time. Well, we all know that agriculture is a big deal here in Southern Alberta. Still, many people don't know a lot about the industry and the diversity of agricultural activities, which takes place in and around their community. Alberta Open Farm Days is a provincial initiative designed to help people experience local agricultural activities. This weekend, farms, agricultural organizations, and agribusinesses across the province will be throwing open their doors for Alberta Open Farm Days events. Farming Smarter is one of the local organizations hosting an event this weekend. Brett Brown has more. Each year, Farming Smarter gives hundreds of visitors the chance to experience agriculture up close. The Lethbridge-based Research Association is busy this week preparing its Open Farm Days event August 17th. Communications Coordinator Sean Chose says Farming Smarter has lots of family fun activities planned, including a charity barbecue, scavenger hunt, wagon rides, and bouncy castles. Yeah, it's your opportunity to come out learn a little bit more about agriculture, ask some questions to the people involved, and just get a better understanding of how your food gets to the table. Open Farm Days is a fun day for families, but for Farming Smarter, it serves a broader purpose, according to Assistant Manager Jamie Pushinger. She says the event is an opportunity to showcase the work that Farming Smarter does and help create awareness about agricultural issues. The initiative is aimed to get folks out to a farm to learn and engage in agriculture, to learn about the industry. And I think this is our eighth year hosting the event and and so Farming Smarter really wants to connect with the folks in the city and the people that have no connection to a farm these days to really understand you know, the significance of the industry as well as the research that goes into it. A good example of the practical education at Open Farm Days is the sweet spot, which showcases the journey of sugar from the farm to retail products like cookies and candy. Farming Smarter has partnered with Economic Development Lethbridge, Atlantic Sugar, Boots Mob Bakery, and How Sweet Inc. for this project. You get to learn the process of growing a sugar beet, processing that into sugar, and then sending it out into the world as cookies. The Farming Smarter event is not the only local Alberta Farm Days event this weekend. Several other Lethbridge and area farms and businesses are also participating. A full list is available on the Alberta Farm Days website. For Bridge City News, I'm Brett Brown. And speaking of farms and even farm animals, according to a new study, it seems horses are much more intelligent than people have given them credit for. Researchers say they're capable of complex thought processes and may even be able to plan ahead. How are you, fist bump? Good boy. Good boy. They pick up emotions really easily, so... 
It's like if you're upset, they'll like come and comfort you and stuff. And if you're happy, then they'll pick up on that. Say if I come to a fence and I'm quite nervous, then he'll get nervous. And then when I'm like going into it with very positive thoughts, he's he just jumps it perfectly. Um, from my own perspective, which has been you know schooling horses and training them over a lifetime, all their senses are massively heightened from ours, which makes it appear as if they've got a sixth sense. It's a little bit like humans playing chess. So you can think a couple of steps ahead. If I move here, then this might happen. And that's something that's actually quite complex. And we didn't think horses could do that. But our study suggests that actually they might be able to do something similar to that. See, there's something to that horse whisperer thing. They're brilliant. Well, Canada is closely monitoring Hurricane Ernesto, which is expected to intensify over the weekend as it approaches Bermuda. The tropical storm pummeled Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands with torrential rain. The Canadian Hurricane Center expects the storm to pass over Canadian waters, but says it's too early to tell what the potential impact on land could be. The U.S. National Hurricane Center says Ernesto is expected to become upgraded to a major Category 3 storm in the coming days. Well, sometimes in Lethbridge, we experience what feels like hurricane strength winds, but nothing compared to what the folks on those islands are going through today. Here in southern Alberta, we saw beautiful sunshine and 29 degrees today. And now this evening, however, we could see a few showers. I'll be right back with a full look at the weather. Welcome back. Well, it looks like those showers I told you about earlier might be disappearing. We're now seeing partly cloudy skies this evening and tomorrow we are getting back into some sunshine. However, we could see some showers returning Thursday night. We are seeing a 60% chance of showers. High of 28 though, we could see a risk of a thunderstorm later in the evening as well. Tomorrow, as we get into Friday, we are seeing periods of rain. High of only 22. That's going to keep that temperature down there quite a bit. Then we're rising again for the weekend. Look at that. 26 on Saturday, 28 on Sunday with clear skies for both of those days. Back to 27 on Monday and 28 again on, on uh, Tuesday, that would be, uh, to round out that seven-day forecast. So the average high for this time of year, 26. Average low, 10. 37 was our record high on this day. And then happened back in 1994. And in 1995, we were sitting at only three de degrees, which was the record low for this day. Sun rose this morning at 622 uh, and sunset this evening right at 849. Four minutes less daylight than we saw yesterday. So we're seeing uh, 14 hours and 27 minutes of daylight today. Okay, on the west coast tomorrow, not too bad at all. 21 for a high with a mix of sun and cloud in Victoria. Vancouver, a uh, high of 23 degrees. 26 for the high in Edmonton. Now, Edmonton was under a, um, a smoke advisory earlier today. It was actually an air quality advisory due to some local smoke. They could see that local smoke return tomorrow. And then tomorrow in Calgary, seeing hazy conditions, could see a chance of showers and risk of a thunderstorm later on in the day with a high of 25 degrees. As we see the rest of the prairies, here 28 for the high in Saskatoon same thing with Regina clear skies in both of those cities Winnipeg could see periods of rain tomorrow high of 26 as we get over to the central part of the country Toronto seeing a high of 28 clear skies 29 for the high in Ottawa with some rain and 29 as well in Montreal with mainly sunny skies there as we get to Atlantic Canada we're not seeing the effects of that Hurricane Ernesto uh, quite yet, but we, what we are seeing is we could see a slight chance of shower. So 30% in Fredericton, high of 24 there, 30% in Halifax, 25 for a high there, 23 the high in Charlottetown with a mix of sun and cloud and clear skies in St. John's tomorrow with a high of 20 degrees. So there you have it. That is your forecast. The Business Council of Alberta is demanding federal intervention as a strike threat looms in the Canadian rail industry. Council President Adam Legg says a prolonged work stoppage would end up causing deep and long-lasting impacts to all Canadians, particularly farmers in Western Canada. Labour Minister Stephen McKinnon has been meeting with provincial government's officials and he uh, has urged railway and union representatives to hash out a deal at the bargaining table. Canadian National Railway and Canadian Pacific Kansas City have begun stopping shipments ahead of a potential strike or lockout that could happen next week. 
A Calgary company that ocu uh, documents hail damage to vehicles for insurance claims is working flat out after a hailstorm last week pounded part of the city. DCC Hail has a device called a hail scanner that uses cameras and artificial intelligence to count and mark every dent to vehicles. Operations manager Devin Fenton says a process that would have taken hours now takes minutes with the technology. DCC's parking lot lot is jammed with almost 200 cars, trucks and SUVs deemed total losses by insurers. The U.S. has nearly doubled duties on Canadian softwood lumber and the B.C. Lumber Trade Council says it couldn't come at a worst time. Council President Kirk Nickaday says the hike will affect manufacturing operations, jobs and communities around the province. International Trade Minister Mary Ng says the U.S. Department of Commerce has increased duties from 8 percent to 14.54 4 percent. She calls the move unfair and unwarranted. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 141 points to 22,760. The Dow was also up 242 points to 40,008. The S&P 500 was up 20 points to 5,455. And the Nasdaq was up 4 points to 17,192. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $1.16 to $77.19 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was up $0.08 cents to $2.23 U.S. Gold was down $22.50 to $2,445 U.S. an ounce. And silver was down $0.44 cents to $27.25 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $7.43 per bushel. Barley is at $5.55, canola is at $13.07, and corn is at $6.99 per bushel. Live cattle August contract was up $0.60 cents to $184.60. Feeder cattle was up $1.43 to $247.90, and lean hogs August contract was up $0.20 cents to $90.10. And the Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 72 cents U.S. Recapping one of our top stories, Immigration Minister Mark Miller says he plans to look into whether a man accused of plotting a terror attack in Toronto should have his Canadian citizenship revoked. The man and his son face nine terrorism charges and are accused of conspiracy to commit murder on behalf of the Islamic State group. Miller says he's tasked his deputy minister with establishing a timeline of how the older of the two men became a Canadian citizen. Canada has the ability to revoke a person's citizenship if they obtain it by providing false information or hiding relevant facts. Still to come, these days it can be difficult to decipher truth from misinformation, especially when it comes to politics. After the break, BCN producer Michael Clausen speaks with John Robson, columnist for the National Post, who wrote an article about this very topic. That is next. And when you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also be sure to visit our website anytime to check our number of stories and interviews. What would our world look like if we ever saw truth in politics? And do we ever currently see truth in politics? And if we do, what happens to the politician? And how does the public respond to that revelation of truth? Well, today's guest joins us from Ottawa. He is Dr. John Robson and a professor at Augustine College and a columnist with the National Post, Looney Politics, and also the Epoch Times where he recently wrote an article entitled Refusing to Lie or to Acquiesce in One is Vital for a Thriving Society. Good to have you with us, Dr. Robson. It's a pleasure to be here, he said truthfully. Yes, awesome. 
Yeah, it goes without saying, if, if someone's talking to me and they, they start a sentence with being truthfully honest or in all honesty, it causes me to wonder what happened to the veracity of what came before. So I want to ask you, you quote John 8.32 in your article, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If everyone pledged never to tell a lie or to acquiesce in a lie, you suggest it would have a significant impact on our society. It would be, I think, transformative. Mm. And I want to say that it also would be transformative to the people who decide to do it. And then I want to be very clear, as I always try to be, uh, I'm not suggesting here that what we need is for everybody to be like me. This is not about how great I am. It's about how great the truth is. And when you look at it, just to begin with in politics, what is the number one thing that people hate about politicians? The thing that comes up again and again in surveys and in conversations, that politicians don't tell the truth. They say what they think will advance them personally, what will advance their party. And they're cunning at it. They put enormous amounts of time and effort into spin control, the result of which, paradoxically, is that nobody believes anything that comes out of their mouths, with rare exceptions. So it's even self-defeating tactically. But at a much more profound level, it means that government goes badly wrong and we can't have a proper discussion about what's wrong because you can't say that is the rule on almost anything that's true and important. For instance, that the Canadian healthcare system not only isn't working, but can't work as currently structured. That Canada has too much immigration. That Canadian governments spend too much and they try to do too much. Or even, and this was actually what triggered this whole thing. Okay. I got to thinking about this about a year ago because I was at a dinner that began with one of those usual uh, sanctimonious land acknowledgements. Right. And I sat there thinking to myself, this is a double lie. It is a lie because many of the people in the audience do not believe that they are on stolen land and because the people who actually do think so don't intend to give it back which in many respects is worse. And I thought, okay, here I am, the outlier weirdo, you know, don't make a fuss and annoy people. And then after the dinner was over, somebody that I knew but not very well came up to me and said, we've got to do something about those land acknowledgements. They're totally untrue. And about three or four other people from the table came over and joined in, and they all thought the same thing. And I thought, wait a minute, we all know this is a lie, and we've been sitting here cowed, either by fear of the authorities or just a desire not to offend people and be you know, ostracized for the rest of the evening, when in point of fact, these land acknowledgements are even a big obstacle to reconciliation, to moving forward on the Aboriginal file, which is one of the worst messes in Canada today. And what's at the core of the whole problem? They're false. They're actually untrue. They're based on false history and they make false promises. And I thought, what if we all just said no? And that put me in mind of this thing. And now I can't find it that somebody I'm sure somewhere said, if everybody under communism had insisted on telling the truth for one day, it would have collapsed. But so many people in so many parts of the world and in so many areas of their lives live lies and they think it makes their lives easier. But this is where you get to the personal part. It doesn't. It is a transformative experience to say, from now on, I will not be part of falsehoods. I mean, sometimes it's awkward, right? There are moments where it would be easier to lie. You could get more money. You could escape from an awkward situation. But then you get caught in the lie, and you have to keep living it. And it's not a call to be rude to people or unduly harsh in your judgments, but to be honest, never to say the thing that is not, and never to sit there nodding and smiling or even just silent when you hear something you know isn't true. God, I've got to ask you this. We, we do hear so many lies lies in politics and media, does lying really matter? Well, I think that it does. And, and as I say, I, I think it matters in public policy mm -hmm. because it means that people are misdiagnosing a problem and then providing wrong solutions and then being deceitful about what actually happened as a result. So you don't get this kind of useful sure. feedback mechanism on what works and what doesn't. But whereas in the marketplace, I mean, one of the classic things, it doesn't matter what lie you tell. If there's no customer in your store, you don't make a sale. They get this inescapable truth that your product is not pleasing the public. Uh, but it's also on a personal level. And again, I brought up this example as it sort of comes up in movies from time to time, but it, it's a real thing where somebody has 
is serving a life sentence in prison and and justly they've been convicted of some terrible thing they did and their whole life has been a mess and you feel sorry for them but they they do belong behind bars and then they find truth normally because they find the lord and they say for the first time in my life i'm free and you think to yourself i mean in some sense this is an absurd statement no you're behind bars and there you will stay you don't get to choose how you're going to spend your day or where who you will associate with any of that but the freedom that comes from setting aside the deceit and living the lie and all of the burdens, it is in fact liberating. And I found this in my own life when I changed my mind on a series of public policy issues. And every time I thought, oh, this is a bit weird, like when I became in favor of uh, civilian gun ownership, because I was believed in gun control when I was young. And I thought, this is, I'm going to go through the rest of my life carrying this idiotic belief that will crush me. And instead it was like, hey, wait a minute. No, my worldview makes more sense. I am freer and easier. I believe in the right to self-defense. Yeah. I believe that an unjust government should be opposed. It all worked for me. And then there were a series of other things, including becoming pro-life right. um, and then becoming Christian. And at every step I thought, well, now I'm really doomed to unpopularity and misery. And instead, every time the burden was lighter. So I say to politicians who are afraid if they tell a lie that their career will end? The answer is probably it won't. People will be so thrilled and excited and pleased that your popularity will soar. But suppose it does, and you have to go and do something else for a living. Okay, you're no longer a politician telling lies and implementing failed policies and pretending they worked. So you give that up. But on the other hand, you're no longer a politician implementing failed policies and deceiving people about what happened. And in your personal life, it's just cleaner. It's lighter. There are plenty of things you can do in this world where you don't have to lie, and you will be a happier and better person. So what's, what? I mean, why not try it? What is to be gained by living in a web of deceit? I mean, you look at the political parties now and their carefully massaged platforms that are just, I don't know how they can stand to recite the talking points. I don't sure. know how they can bear it. Yeah. And it's great for us to be able to have a conversation on this. It, it sounds like lies is just one of the uh, uh, new set of clothing that's, that's given to the emperor for the emperor's new clothes. Uh, yes, we, and, and everybody does it, so it becomes habitual, and you think it's not a big deal, mm -hmm. and, oh, I'm lying today so I can be honest tomorrow. You know, the, the father of lies feeds us all kinds of sure. comforting thoughts about deceit. But at bottom, it's just a bad thing. Everybody knows deceit is bad in a marriage, deceit is bad in a family. You shouldn't deceive sure. your, your uh, kids. Your kids maybe sometimes ought to you know, not be completely frank with you about things, but um, if it's bad in business dealings, why would it be better in politics? Why would this, where the police power of the state is invoked, why would this be the one place where it's really important to lie all the time? Well, I think that in business, it would probably be referred to as fraud. Uh, a new word that we hear a lot is misinformation. Is misinformation not just a fancy word for lying? Well, it is when it's not the government saying that something that's true shouldn't be discussed because they find it unpleasant, which is where misinformation is itself very often a lie, uh, because someone has said something that's actually true, and people are going, oh, yeah, that's true. I didn't realize anybody else thought that. And they're like, no, no, that's misinformation. I, you know, we went through this with COVID, right, with the masks and that sort of thing, and the, the social distancing, and the fact that the idea that this was a deadly disease to healthy middle-aged people, or that... Uh, that if you got the vaccines, you'd never get COVID. We were just told one lie after another. But everybody who tried to say, wait a minute, I'm not sure these vaccines really work very well, or I don't think that it lurks on surfaces, or I don't think the masks are very effective, especially not the cloth ones, uh, was accused of misinformation because they were telling the truth. And that to me is ridiculous. I mean, don't don't use neologisms as a good rule for clean living as well. Right. So are there some examples that you could maybe share with us of politicians who've been good at telling the truth? Yes. And actually, the, the column you referred to came out of a speech that I gave to the Economic Education Association of Alberta, in which I focused on two people in particular. Uh, and one of them was Martin Luther King Jr. And you think what an extraordinary moral beacon he was. And one of the reasons why is that he never 
lied. Well, he, in his personal life, he had some failings, but mm -hmm. in his public life, and on one point in particular, at a time, remember, when this was enormously controversial, do you want full social equality? And it would have been very easy to say, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we're happy to be treated as second rate in all kinds of ways. We don't believe in racial marriage or intermarriage, but there's just a few little things we want. And King never said that. He said, yes, we're all God's children, and I look forward to the day when we sit down in brotherhood in the states in the United States, like Georgia and Alabama, where the situation was worst at the time. And this was, it might sound tactically unwise, but in fact, even tactically, it was enormously powerful because it called people to a vision, and it did get you caught in little deceits. And then the other one that I cited, Patrick Moore, who has spoken at some of those EEA events, though he couldn't make that one. And I'm not saying that everything Greenpeace thought in the early days was correct, but here were some people who said they were always going to act on what they believed and they were always going to be straightforward about it. And they changed the world because they didn't trim and hedge and fudge like some political party. And then the third example, obviously, is Jesus Christ. We can't be him. But at the same time, th this extraordinary power of just saying what is so and saying, I am not going to be rude about it. I'm inviting people on an exciting journey. I'm not trying to exclude them. But here's how things are. And it's enormously important that you should know it. And in the end, it will make you a better and a happier person. So come along with me. And we see how Martin Luther King changed the United States, that I have a dream speech. I think you can still find it online. And if you haven't seen that incredible concluding part of it, it is, again, almost a transformative experience. It's a marvelous thing, and everybody should watch it. Uh, and everybody should think about how we're all environmentalists now because of people like Patrick Moore. And we may still debate the details, and I hope we do so honestly. But the idea that we can afford to ignore human impact on the planet Greenpeace completely changed that, and they did it because of the power of truth and of honesty. And so it really is, again, I say to politicians, don't think I'm asking you to give up your glorious, horrible political career. Uh, I'm saying you could be a much better person and a much better politician if you just told us the truth, including when you don't know something or when you're worried about something or when you think your party's policy in some area may not be as good as the press release said it was. Talk to us like adults, and you'll become an adult. Right. Well, and we want to have that give and take and conversation. It certainly takes uh, courage for politicians and other leaders to swim, let's say, upstream against the popular opinion. Uh, do you think it's possible that maybe even our education system, perhaps, has something to do with this peer pressure? Oh, unquestionably. I mean, one of my things I keep saying is, Everybody knows government-run schools are terrible, so why don't we bring in the voucher system under some name or another so that the government makes sure everybody can afford an education, but it doesn't actually run the schools? And surely it is so much past time to bring this in because the current result is that kids aren't learning, they're not happy, and they're not becoming good citizens. But again, I want to say to politicians, you might think that telling the truth will get you in trouble. And there, it, there will be a jolt. I'm not saying there won't. But if you make some controversial statement, here's what's going to happen. The media are going to say, wow, did you really say that? And then they're going to hand you a microphone. And you get to explain what you said and why you said it. And if you haven't thought it through, you're going to be in the soup. But if you have, it doesn't take as much courage as you might think. I mean, some sense to me, what takes enormous courage is lying of saying, I'm going to live my whole life in a web of deceit and unhappiness. Like that, I wouldn't dare do that. And I'm again, I'm not saying I'm a model, right? I'm just saying the truth will make you free. And it will make you free at all kinds of levels, including you will be a lot freer from anxiety because you will no longer be living at odds with the whole way that you and the universe are meant to be. Yeah. Well, just in that conversation about freedom, it definitely makes me think of uh, me and Bobby McGee by Janis Joplin saying that uh, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Uh, just from, from what we're chatting about here. Now, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think lies have to do with the desire to control the listener? 
Well, yes, obviously, it, it, you're getting into what's that Martin Buber's thing about an I-it relationship with another mm-hmm. human being rather than an I-thou relationship. Yeah. And once again, you're being promised short-term gain, but you're looking at extreme long-term loss. The idea, I mean, whoever gets to their end of their life, is it a Tony Robbins thing about you're on your deathbed? Do you think to yourself, I wish I'd manipulated people more? You know, it's like, I wish I'd spent more time playing video games, you know, or the, oh, I wish I'd spent more time drunk. Uh, there's all these sort of things that nobody ever says on their deathbed. So think about the fact that sooner or later we must all die. And what do you want on your tombstone? You know, he never told the truth unless he had to. I don't think so. I don't think, and I don't think people go into politics thinking, now I shall lie. But the process is very corrupting and subtly so. I understand it's hard. But if you take the long view and say, what do you want people, how would you like people to see you properly speaking? Those who see you as you are, because the Lord sees you as you are. What do you want him to see? Is it somebody who was so good at lying that people thought they were telling the truth? I wouldn't dare get to the pearly gates and have that be what they said. Like they, there's going to be enough bad stuff in the book already. Let's not make it worse, okay? And unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. John, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was great to have you here and to chat about this transformation topic. That was Dr. John Robson. He is a professor at Augustine College and a columnist with the Epoch Times. I think it's safe to say that parenting has always been a challenge. We learn from our successes and our failures. Books, training courses, and those with parenting experience also really helps along the way. Today we're joined by Abe Block, who's a parent, grandparent, and now even a great-grandparent and a retired pastor here in Lethbridge. He has some parenting tips for us. Welcome back to Bridge City News, Abe. Thank you. It's good to be here, and it's good to be with all the listeners that are tuning in. Absolutely, and the viewers too. Now, one thing yes. that probably hasn't changed over the years, Abe, is that siblings tend to have conflicts as they grow up, grow up together. You know, brothers and sisters, various disagreements and arguments. Do you have any advice on how to reduce the frequency of this to get your kids to maybe learn to disagree with each other and still love each other? That's a major uh, issue. Uh, back in my day, and of course that was a while ago, you'll understand. Uh, things were a little different. You did mention that uh, today things have changed. They've changed dramatically. But I think one of the biggest issues, Hal, is the lack of communication. I look at the world today and I understand the young people watching the world today. And what do they see? They see a lot of disagreement. They see a lot of arguing. They see a lack of communication in our society, in our governments, governments relating to, to people and to us. Uh, wars and rumors of wars. And you look at Haiti uh, in the world today, if you're following that at all, I mean, it's absolute chaos. And you say to yourself, this is what our children are seeing. Is it any surprise that they think the natural thing is to disagree and to argue? The other issue could be that if you don't agree with me, you can't be my friend. And so I think that's one of the key issues. And so we as parents, We need to set up a time. The Bible says train up a child in the way that it should go. And when it is old, it will remember and learn and be. How do we train? The other thing that reminds me is that in our world as well, we have husband and wife working so much out of the home. So where do we find time to train and to teach, to teach? With my children, I set up what I call the Yes But Conference every so often, where we would sit down, every child could speak what their issues were, what they liked, what they didn't like, and no one could respond negatively. Each one got a chance, and that meant that we as parents were listening. We heard them, and then we also had opportunity to train and respond. I think that's one of the biggest things. If we can't train, how are they going to learn and we live in chaos? Yeah, communication is key, absolutely, for siblings and then parents to their kids. Now, how about forgiveness and apologies, Abe? How important are they as we develop a stronger relationship with our kids and grandkids? I think that's a great thing. Apologies and forgiveness work together. And it depends on what, what is an apology. You see, so often in our world, we simply hear, well, I'm sorry. 
And what kind of a response? Oh, don't even think about it. Well, that's not dealing with anything. If I'm going to apologize, I need to apologize to the issue. What was the issue? That's what I'm apologizing for, and it needs to be from the heart. And then the response needs to be a response to the issue. Never say, oh, it was nothing. What needs to be said is, yes, you hurt me, and I thank you for the apology, and I really want to forgive you. But that doesn't mean that there's going to be reconciliation. When the apology is correct and the response is to the issue, you're opening the door for reconciliation. And I think that's one of the keys in all of this. I think back to what our government is trying to do with truth and reconciliation with our, our Aboriginal people. Okay, where's the truth and what's the reconciliation? Have we ever spelled it out? And so if you don't spell these things out to each other, it's just, I'm sorry, don't worry about it. That doesn't go anywhere in my books. Abe, let's talk about discipline for just a moment here. I know when my son was younger, he hated the fact we put him in the corner, standing all alone in the corner, you know, for, to show some discipline, but he'd appreciate it afterwards and he would apologize and we would clear the air about certain things, maybe if there's a misunderstanding as well. How important is discipline and maybe setting up that structure for our kids today? I think discipline is in, in, increasing, increasingly important. In our world, if there's not going to be that kind of a setup, the world isn't going to cater to you. For example, I see a lot of parents in the modern world saying to the two-year-old child, what do you want for breakfast? Day after day, what do you want for, what do you want for lunch, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that child is way too young to make those decisions. Chocolate. I want chocolate. Give me chocolate. I want chocolate. And an ice that's cream. Not, an ice cream, right? That's not going to be the world they get into <laughs> at all. And so I think uh, discipline needs to be in moderation, but it needs to be in relation to what the problem was, not just some wild thing out there, but try and build it so that they learn there are consequences. Look at the world today. A lot of people haven't learned consequences and we're living with a lot of difficulty and chaos in our world because there are consequences. As you grow up and get into your job, there are going to be discipline issues. You need to learn them when you're young and when it's not so hard. Let's circle back to structure for just a moment here, Abe. How important is it to really set up the boundaries for our kids? Well, I think that's the key issue. If the kids raise with, uh, without any boundaries when they're young, they're not going to expect any boundaries when they go and work in an organization and there are going to be boundaries and they've never learned that. So how are they going to deal with boundaries when they've got a job if they've never learned it when they're young? We need to teach when they're younger so that they learn it and walk into life and walk into occupations and walk into situations with, with people where they need to learn to listen. And I think a lot of our young people do want boundaries. I remember the one that dad talking to me and, and his daughter was invited by the school to an issue where she knew she probably shouldn't go. And so she said to her dad, dad, will you please tell me I can't go? That way I save face when I face my kids and you can take the blame, but you're not in the picture. I think that works. Now, what's the balance between setting healthy boundaries, Abe, and on the flip side, giving your kids and maybe your teenagers some freedom? I think the freedom comes when they learn where the freedom is within boundaries. For example, uh, for the younger children, give them space, but set the boundaries. For example, I know some girls, when they start school, they already want to dress the way they want to dress. And so I would suggest to the mother, pick up what you think are reasonable ones, but give them an option about three or four. But don't give them an option of the whole expanse of what they have, because that's not suitable. So let them make choices within boundaries so that they learn, OK, I can make a choice, but there are boundaries. Because in life, that's how it's going to be. I'm going to have to have boundaries but I'm also going to be able to learn how to make choices. Like with finances, give them small finances at the beginning so that they can learn to be responsible and accountable, but within the boundaries of whatever their, their finances are. 
Now let's talk about, we mentioned the boundaries, but how about when your kids disagree with you when it comes to said boundaries? You know, I used to ask my father, well, why can't I do this? He said, because I said so. That was always his reasoning behind it, right? Well, no, that's, you need, kids need more than that. So how do we nurture that relationship and create a positive, healthy relationship when we're setting those boundaries? Well, I can take an example in my own life. Uh, my one daughter uh, uh, didn't have her driver's license yet, and she worked at a record shop, and the guy had a beautiful souped-up, well, not a souped-up car, but a very nice car, but he wanted to sell it. And she looked at that car, and she wanted to buy it uh, all the best way. So what can I do but say no? No, I didn't say no. I sat down with her. I said, okay, how can we work, work this out? Because you can't even drive it. If you're going to buy it, it's going to sit on the yard and just whatever. So I happened to have a friend who taught mechanics in the school, and he needed vehicles to teach mechanics to the kids. So I said to my daughter, go ahead and buy the thing. Let's talk to this guy, see if he'll take the car, use it for a whole year in the school. You'll get a car that's fixed up by the time you can drive it. That way you can get it, but there are boundaries set up and you're going to have to wait for it. I think if we can set up things like that with our kids to make them feel positive and yet within some kind of control factors, I think that might work. You know, it's funny, when I was 16, I bought my first car, an old Datsun. I had just enough money, $1,000 to buy it, but it was a manual transmission, so I had to learn how to shift the manual <laughs> transmission. And then I had yeah, to right. save up more money to insure yep. it and register to put it on the road. So that took another three, four months. So Exactly, uh, but that's a good plan. That works. Yeah, it was a lesson, a life lesson, absolutely. So Abe, how important is it for parents to maybe play some games or activities with their kids to help maybe draw them a little closer for bonding, like bonding time with our children? We talked about communications before. What better way to communicate with your kids than either play games with them or to do sports with them. It opens the door to, to conversation and communication is the best thing. And especially if you're catering to some of their desires, even if you're not an athlete or anything, but you can support, you can be there, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think I, I've done a lot of counseling and I asked this one couple once, what do you remember most about your parents? And the one person said, my dad was at every game I ever played. But the other person said, my dad loved me more than I could ever imagine. You know, those are two opposites, but they're both beautiful. And they bring in communication. I, I think we have forgotten the idea of communicating and then still disagreeing, but communicating and loving each other anyway. We don't have to think the same but we need to be on the same page in the final end. You know what I've noticed as a parent myself as well of two kids, my son and my daughter, is praising them, especially with their successes mm -hmm. and helping them through their failures as well. What did we learn? Like a life lesson that's learned here. Abe, another big part of parenting is the process of passing our faith onto our children. How can we do this most effectively? Well, we need to find time, first of all. I mean, like I said before, with all parents doing so much working outside of the home. And I'm not decrying that. It's a necessity in our world, I think. But it seems like that takes away time. And uh, putting your faith uh, in an encouraging way with your children is going to take time. And part of that time, we I, I, for example, like to have devotions once a day. My dad had devotions every supper time. We always took 15, 20 minutes for him to teach us his faith. And then he had a question and answer period after we had eaten, if we had any questions about it. The other thing is, can we take them either to home groups or to Bible study groups or to church or to places like that? And that refers me back to how communicative is my church to everybody and including youth? Do I spend, do I have people in the church that can communicate and relate to the young people and build their faith? But it's got to start at home. We cannot depend on the church to do it all. We are responsible to begin that process when they're young. And then we encourage them as they mature to find it in other places as well. And important, very important to live our faith as well. Abe, I think most of us as children when we were younger had some insecurity issues, what child didn't. Any thoughts on the importance of hugging 
and loving our children, like the physical touch and communicating that love to our children? Well, you're talking to the wrong guy. I'm a hugger. And I love to hug, but I have to be very careful. In our modern world, that's not accepted by everybody. It's not even accepted by society in many ways. We, we have become very individualistic. And so I have had to become very sensitive to, to how people feel about being hugged and about touching. I remember, especially during COVID, now this was during COVID, but out in New Brunswick, there was a kindergarten boy who hugged one of the kindergarten girls and they took him to court. Now that's really extreme, but they did take him to court because he wasn't supposed to hug anybody. But you know, we are missing, we are missing the personal touch. That is so encouraging. And if we can just live with it without reacting, I think it's a very positive thing. I think touch is crucial. The Bible tells us, what did Jesus do? He took the little children and he put them on his lap. And I'm thinking he hugged them. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. We have gotten to the stage of a little bit too much forbidding. I think the encouragement needs to be there. You know, you're right. The human interaction is vital to healthy relationships whatever yes. they are. Now it seems we're getting busier and busier these days, Abe, with scattered schedules for parents, many different family members always on the road. How important is it to actually to sit down during family time and have meals together? I think that's a key. In my family, when I grew up, we always had at least one meal together. The supper meal, we were together. Nowadays with the kids scattering all over the place, the parents taking them here and there, Find one meal where you can be together. Even at the, at the beginning of the day, that's not possible anymore. Some dads are leaving at six o'clock in the morning and the kids aren't even out of bed yet getting ready for school. There needs to be a place. It doesn't have to be around a meal. I like the meal idea because that's open discussion. That, that's where everybody's just relaxed and they're eating and they're joking. And, and it's a good place for interaction and for discussion and for questions. But nowadays, it's hard to sit down to a meal together with even the kids going all over the place. But my idea is somewhere, find a time in the day, and if it's not every day, find a time somewhere during the week, a couple of times, to sit together as a family. That's relationships. That's necessary in many areas of our lives. Let's sit down and break bread together. Abe, Abe Block is a retired Lethbridge pastor. He's also a grandfather, great-grandfather, and of course a father. Thanks so much for some of the great parenting advice today, Abe. My joy. God bless. You as well. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Thanks for all.